So, as I say, the radicals gain support as Johnson's policy begins to seem less and less, uh, less and less viable. Now, but they faced enormous obstacles. The radicals did not control Congress the way some previous historians used to say. The obstacles to radicalism were very strong. There was the constitutional tradition of federalism. As I said, most of the rights they're talking about are things that the states have traditionally governed, not the federal government. And there were many people on a purely non-racial basis who thought that's the way government should be organized. There was the desire for normalcy, as happens after any war. Johnson's putting Reconstruction into effect. Do we want to have another giant crisis, get rid of those governments, go back to the beginning? I don't know. Um, Laissez-faire, limited government. Is the, you know, is, is the federal government going to be a constant overseer of what's going on in the South? When is that ever going to end? And of course, racism. The idea of a white man's government had a potent appeal. The Civil War had weakened it, but it was certainly powerful among all the Democrats and among some conservative Republicans as well. So what pushes the, the moderates to the radicals? It is the crisis itself. It is the impasse. The crisis between Johnson and Congress radicalizes the situation. And this, of course, is Johnson's great failing, that he doesn't understand that he needs to compromise. If he doesn't, the radicals will, t will, will gain strength. Many people wonder, I've wondered myself, you know, what would have happened if Lincoln had lived? What would Lincoln have done? I, I speculate about this in the end of my book, just because everyone asked me, and I say, oh, go read that. I'm tired of talking about it. But, um, <laughs> You know, Lincoln would never have gotten himself into It's impossible, it's inconceivable to imagine Lincoln being impeached by Congress. It's inconceivable that he would be so alienated from the Congress, from the Republican Party, from Northern public opinion that law after law would be passed over his veto. No, Lincoln would have worked out a, co a compromise with Congress. No question about it. What it would have been, I don't know. But on the other hand, that would have derailed the radical impulse in an odd sort of way because it's the very crisis that is the creative element. It's the crisis that forces people to think in new ways and move to positions that they never thought they would, uh, take, uh, that they would take before. So, and moreover, the, the antagonism with Johnson, which develops very quickly, puts a tremendous premium on party unity. Everything that Congress does now has to have a two-thirds majority. You've got to get it over Johnson's veto. So that means moderates, they all have to act together. The, the, the unity of the Republican Party is amazing in this period. Six out of Johnson's seven vetoes are overridden by Congress. Um, moderates, and, but that means compromise too. The radicals can't get everything they want, but the moderates have to give in some kind of general agreement has to be made. So okay, let, this, let's see how this happens in the beginning of 1860, well, 1866, late 1865. Congress assembles finally December 1865. Johnson announces Reconstruction's over. Loyal government has been established in the South. The basic rights of the freed people are guaranteed. The 13th Amendment has been ratified. Seward, the Secretary of State, announces enough states have ratified the 13th Amendment that it is now part of the Constitution. Slavery is irrevocably abolished in this country. Um, Southern members of Congress and Senate are knocking on the door. We've been elected. Here we are to take our seats. Most of them are ex-Confederate generals and people like that, but they've been elected. The clerk of the House of Representatives, McPherson of Pennsylvania, a sidekick of Stevens, omits the names of the Southern delegates when he calls the roll of the House. When they, the first day, who's here? This guy, he doesn't call them. The Republicans have decided we're not quite ready to let these guys in and recognize Johnson's government. Um, the radicals try to seize the initiative. Immediately, Ashley of Ohio introduces a bill to abrogate the Johnson government's institute black suffrage in the South and have new government. But this is completely rejected. Most Republicans don't want that at this point. Rather, the moderates, not the radicals, put forward a plan to um, modify Johnson's program, 
two major laws put forward by Lyman Trumbull, a moderate Republican chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Trumbull puts the two bills, early 1865. This is to make Johnson's, keep the Johnson governments in place, but make them better. One extends the life of the Freedmen's Bureau. Freedmen's Bureau has been established for just one year. It's going to go out of existence in March. Extend the life of the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was quite controversial. On the one hand, here's two images of the Freedmen's Bureau. Here's one of the Freedmen's, see the Freedmen's Bureau agent as a sort of arbiter in the South between two angry groups. On one side, the white Southerners on the left, all armed and angry with their fists in the air. And on the right, blacks, and they're all armed and have their fists in the air. In other words, black and white in the South are about to come to blows to each other. The Freedman's Bureau agent is the umpire or the arbiter or the peacemaker or whatever you want to call it. Now, it is true he is looking toward the whites. He's trying to keep the whites at bay. But nonetheless, basically, he's the promoter of racial uh, peace. And this is the Democratic and Johnson image of the Freedman's Bureau. The Freedman's Bureau, an agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man. There's a happy black person sitting there lounging around. On the left in the corner, a white guy is chopping wood. He's working. There's another white guy in the field. In other words, whites are working. Taxes on them are supporting the black people in idleness. That's what the Freedmen's Bureau is. It's, it's telling them you don't have to work. It's, you know, sustain the president and you protect the white man. This is Johnson's, Johnson's uh, you know, program, so to speak. Um, so the Freedmen's Bureau bill passes the Congress, passes the Congress, and Johnson <coughs> vetoes it. Johnson vetoed the great surprise. Every Republican is in favor of continuing the Freedmen's Bureau for a while. Johnson vetoes it. In vetoing it, he, do, he rejects. Seward, who's still in there as Secretary of State, writes a conciliatory veto message saying, all right, the Freedmen's Bureau's got some good, but there's some aspects of it I don't like, so let's send it back for revision. No, Johnson doesn't take that. Johnson writes his own veto message, which condemns the entire idea of any federal assistance to the former slaves. And in doing so, one of the things about Johnson that is very important, and we will see this as we go along, Johnson articulates the rationale for opposition to federal assistance to blacks that survives down to the present day. You can hear echoes of Andrew Johnson's veto messages if you just listen uh, uh, nowadays. The federal government, he says, has never felt itself authorized to spend public money for white people, toiling honestly. It was never intended that the freedmen should be fed, educated, sheltered by the United States. In other words, this is what we have come to call reverse discrimination. Aiding the former slaves is somehow, you know, discriminating against whites. Congress has never aided whites in this way, to which Sumner in the Senate said, well, white men have not been in slavery for 250 years. You know, that's an absurd analogy. Johnson then goes on to say that none of these, no legislation be, should be passed on Reconstruction until the Southern representatives are seated. Otherwise, Congress should not act. Trumbull then, on that basis, he's going to veto every single thing we pass, which is indeed what happens. He finally goes on to say, the president represents the entire people. My view of this is more broad-minded. Congress, the members of Congress only represent individual constituencies. The president represents the people of the United States. Trumbull says, this is modest for a man made president by an assassin. Nobody has, made Andrew, nobody has voted to make Andrew Johnson the tribune of, of all the people. But basically he says, all these issues of the freedmen should be left to the individual states. The bill is vetoed. They fail at first to override the veto by one vote. But then later in the year, they do pass another one which passes over his veto. So the Freedmen's Bureau will actually continue until 1870. 